So I am here from Versailles to welcome Ivan Day. Even in the 17th century in Versailles, we have heard of this marvelous man. And so it only seemed appropriate for me to fly. I couldn't imagine what would be at the Getty. But indeed, there is a sugar sculpture here. I'm Marcia Reed. I'm the chief curator at the Getty Research Institute. And the Edible Monument is an exhibition that has been really fun to plan and to put up. And Ivan Day was one of the major inspirations and provider of enormous assistance and wisdom and knowledge for the exhibition. And as you know, it is his sugar sculpture, which is in the show and which will travel around as the show uh, pro possibly is going to the Detroit Institute of Art and is going to be at the Bard Graduate Center in New York in 2018. They'll, they'll change as they go to the different museums. There'll be different groupings. Ivan is probably the world expert in feasting, street food, how food was made, prepared, sought for, and then presented and put on the table. He has a particular interest in British food. He actually has an ax to grind about how good British food <laughs> is. But <laughs> used to be. And also international food. It's a tremendous pleasure to have Ivan come here today and tell you many things that he knows about feasting and dining. He has wonderful slides that you will really enjoy. And so it is such a pleasure to have on Ivan here. The one thing that I want to recommend to you is his website and his blog. They are terrific. They change all the time. They keep us in touch with what Ivan is working on now. And so I really, if you just Google Ivan Day, you can get to it. So welcome, Ivan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marsha. Well, I think what I'm going to try to do is to show you some images and talk about them in the hope that it will enrich your visit to the Edible Monument exhibition. And the talk is very much centered around what you will see in those little galleries, but also put them into context. But before I deal with that, um, I just want to say a little bit about my methodology. What you're looking at on the screen at the moment um, is an edible monument, if you like, that was produced for the interval of an opera that was performed at the Palazzo Odolskalki in Rome in 1714 to commemorate the Empress of the Holy Roman Empire's birthday. And there were 150 musicians who performed an extraordinary opera called Sacrificio a Venere, a sacrifice to Venus. And in between the two acts, all of the guests, who were the sort of aristocrats and various cardinals in Rome, were treated to this. This was the refreshment in the interval, equivalent to the ice cream you might get when you go to the movies. And in fact, this is not sugar sculpture. This landscape is entirely made out of gelato, and made of ice cream. Although, it wasn't called that in Italy at this time, it was called sorbetti. Now, just to put it into context, this is my next job. This is a job we're going to do in Prague and then in Rome in a couple of years' time. We've already done the opera. We did it last year on the 28th of August, 2014, 300 years exactly to the day, but we didn't have the Hollywood budget that we need to do the ice creams in the interval. Um, and we're going to do it using 18th century techniques. We, 150 ice cream makers made this construction. Because the thing about ice cream in Rome in August is, it, <laughs> you're talking about 
a real ephemeral artwork here. Okay. Now, let me just say a few things about it. You can see at the top, there's a tree. This is an artificial tree hung with 150 oranges and lemons made of ice cream. And it's sitting in a, a, a sort of great vase, which is made of ice. And the earth in the vase is made from uh, shumidi chocolato, kind of chocolate mousse. All of the other pieces around are either ices in the form of pyramids or there are gelatine, there are jellies as well, um, but it, and some confetti um, or, or sweetmeats. Um, now, to put this into context, this is something that is part of a much bigger festival. We have opera. It's a celebration of the Empress, Empress's birthday. There's also a huge firework display outside for the populace of Rome. There are triumphal arches that are built in the streets on the way to the palace. Um, so they're coming through the arches in their carriages. When they arrive at the palace, they are given ices in their carriages before they go into um, the cortelier. It's in the courtyard of the actual um, palace that this was performed. So these extraordinary constructions of food are usually very much from the aristocratic layer of European society. Uh, this is outside, but it's not street food as we know it. Okay. So the context is usually much larger than the food. It's, there's all sorts of other things usually going on with these events. But let's start very early on and try to get inside these things. We normally see food as something that sustains us. We enjoy it. It sometimes looks good. But at these incredible court events, it was often imbued with much deeper meaning. For instance, in this part of the world, a custard pie is something that Buster Keaton might throw in your face if you wandered through kind of Rodeo Drive or whatever. But in the, 14th, in the 15th century, this custard pie, and I've just made it from a very detailed description, was put in front of an eight-year-old boy who had just become the King of England, Henry VI, in Westminster Hall in 1429. And this is one dish of about 15 in the first course of his meal. And it's described as a, a, a crustad, a custard, with a leopard, which is a lion, actually, and in its claw, it grasps a fleur-de-lis. The, the lion was the emblem of England. The fleur-de-lis is the emblem of France, which his father had fought in Agincourt. And it's a statement of England is claiming to own France, or at least to rule over it. So this young eight-year-old boy um, is claiming jurisdiction over France as well. And that's all said as a political statement in a custard tart. There was also a pie in the form of a shield, um, which is adorned with borage flowers, quartered in red and white. The only red they had then is something called Sanders wood, and it makes this funny brick color. And borage flowers and lozenges gilt. Gold was a cordial medicine um, a substance that was meant to give the boy a kind of light, a very, very um, benevolent outlook, as were the borage flowers. They're almost astrological. So all of the food is imbued with this extraordinary meaning. In between the courses, there were food sculptures which were displayed. And this one is one we made um, for a movie, actually, um, which was about medieval food. So you see it here in a kitchen with, with roasting going on in the background. And you see that in a lot of Netherlandish paintings from the early modern period. Um, but this shows the young king, the eight-year-old boy. This is from a very detailed description. There's no image. This is totally conjectural, whether it looked like exactly like this. But we did it in the style of, of alabasters from this period. It's made out of almond paste. And the young king is kneeling before the virgin and child. 
and he's imploring them to recognise his right to rule over France and England. On the left, you see Saint-Denis of France, and on the right, you see St. George of England. So in this food sculpture, you've got this very powerful message of political intent. So we tend to think of kind of sugar being a decorative thing. It's a thing you put on the top of a cupcake when you make little swirls and, and uh, drizzles and sprin sprinkles. But here you see food having a very strong, powerful, iconographic and emblematic meaning. Here it is on the table. Marzipan or almond paste was a popular medium, but a lot of these sculptures are sometimes made from inedible materials like wax. If they were made from sugar, there were two methods. One was to boil sugar up from a syrup until it reached a fairly high temperature, between 240 and 260 Fahrenheit. And then you could pour it into a terracotta mold, which was wet, slightly wet, and the sugar would crystallize. If you took it to higher temperatures, you could end up with sugar that was transparent, like glass. And this is a drawing of a surviving sugar mold, probably from the late 15th century, showing um, St. Catherine of Siena. Um, and in fact, at the coronation feast of Henry V, who was Henry VI's father, there was a sugar sculpture of St. Catherine of Siena. Let me share this with you. These are some of the most remarkable and probably earliest colored images we have of sugar sculpture. These were presented at an extraordinary feast in Pesaro in northern Italy in 1475 at a wedding um, of the Sforza family. It was held in their family palazzo. There were 12 courses of the meal. They were divided into six so there were two sections. The first six courses took place during the daytime and they were ruled over by the sun and there was a figure of the sun looking rather like Marsha here in a costume presiding over it and the second six courses were presided over by the moon because they took place at night. And every course was choreographed with particular goddesses, nymphs and other figures serving the food and then these extraordinary objects were often wheeled into the room. And what you see here are three human figures dressed in antiquity type you know, dresses. And they represent um, astronomy, rhetoric, and grammar. So the three ladies. And they are carrying Mount Elicon, you know, imbued with sort of symbols of, of learning. Um, and the figures on Mount Elicon are made of sugar, as is the whole of Mount Elicon as well. And you can see that they're, they're painted, they're polychromy, they're, they're not white sugar. This is a very, very early image from this marvelous wedding feast. It's in the Vatican Library. Um, and here's another one um, showing, again, a human figure wearing a very special costume. This is the influence of fortune and the figure is carrying a kind of pail or bucket made of sugar and painted to look real. And inside it, there are hundreds of sugar coins. On one side is a portrait of the bride, on the other, a portrait of the groom, and then they're gilded. And the influence of fortune walks around the hall and throws the coins to all of the guests. One of the courses was entirely eaten from large plates and served on large plates made of sugar and painted to look like Italian maiolica. Um, there were even drinking vessels and cups made from sugar for that course, which they consumed. One of the last um, things that were shown, they called these things triumphi, sugar triumphi. The last triumpho was in fact the great philosophers as real people dressed as philosophers, but carrying in books with their actual works, but the books are made of sugar and the text in them 
was drawn on the sugar, and it was the actual Latin text of their, um, their, their books. It was a remarkable occasion. So you've got to realise that this sort of work is very much embedded in a particular festival or important high status or royal event. And uh, it's difficult for us to appreciate some of the meanings that these had for the participants. Right, let's now look at a particular genre, bas-relief. Let's look at bas-relief sculptures that are edible. Um, this is a, a plate from a very famous book that was published in Padova in the early 17th century, authored by a man who was probably, was a Tedesco, a German living in Padova, called Matthias Geiger. It's a book basically about carving, but it has lots of table plans and um, incredible table napkin folding diagrams in it. This is a, a plan to dress sweet foods, what was called the, the ultimo servizio of the meal, the last course of the meal. And it shows you how to lay out various schemes. And one of the dominant things in these schemes is something called a marzipane. If you look, oh, I'm sorry, I've gone, got to find that little light. All right, there it is, okay. Number five, marzipane, and there are others there. Um, okay, number five again, a big dish. Now, you don't see what's on it, but these are pan-European. You get them all over Europe, and they were often highly ornamented. This is an English um, book from the early 17th century, written by a man who actually travelled in Holland and in France, called John Murrell. And on the right-hand side, you can see a Dutch banquet, now, in England, a banquet at this period actually meant the sweet dishes that you had at the end of the meal or after the meal. And you can see in both of these that the marzipan or the march pain is a very important dish on the table. This is a very well-known southern Netherlandish painting from the Antwerp school painted by Clara Peters. And you can see a very simple March pain or marzipane um, in the middle here. It's this thing here. In some cookery texts, both in Holland but mainly in England, you're told to put a layer of wafers underneath the almond paste and then you crimp the edges so it looks like a pie and you put into it what was called a standard. This is rosemary, which featured a lot in the iconography of weddings. So to a 17th century owner of this painting, it, it represents a wedding table, actually. Um, these flowers are completely botanically impossible. They're probably made of sugar, and they're on wires, which explains why they are so stiff. This is probably real rosemary. And can you see the little hanging gilt lozenges? So these are little sugar-coated seeds, which were called confetti, or comfits, or dragé, and actually they're making a pattern, a kind of sort of you know, baroque kind of pattern all over it. And I've actually done a drawing of that to show the pattern. Unfortunately, I forgot to put the slide in. But these marzipane were made not only in Italy and England and France, but also in the German-speaking parts of Europe. And I'm showing you here some rather sad images because these perished during the Second World War. When um, Nuremberg was bombed by the Allies, they destroyed this big collection. These are wooden and pewter molds that were used for making these, these marzipan discs. They're usually about 18 inches in diameter. And, of course, when you get to the Renaissance, you start to get these humanist themes, like here you see Venus uh, riding on seahorses. But notice the the laurel wreath around the outside. That becomes an actual um, protocol to do that with these things. And it's often mentioned in the, the cookery literature. And again, a beautiful one. So you press the marzipan paste into this and you end up with this beautiful allegory of taste. 
there were probably others that represented the other senses, but that's the only surviving one. I'll show you another one a little bit later. So usually these were probably made for particular occasions. They were um, paid for by the patrons and they would have an iconography or a heraldic symbolism that was particular to that particular event. This is an early 17th century French mold that was almost certainly designed for a royal visit. It's a long block of boxwood, about that long, and on the square end, which you can't see, was engraved the royal crown. And then all the, these are the four sides of it. So you've got a hunt going on up at the top there, and it was probably a visit of the king to this chateau. We don't know where it comes from. And we've even tried to find out through some of the coats of arms, but it's very puzzling. You've got a full alphabet. You've got little miniature um, marzipans with emblems. Whoops. Like these here. Um, so these could be printed as little individual ones. And then you have the supporters of, very strange one there, an owl, um, to make various coats of arms. Um, and that is one of those wonderful flourishes that goes on the top. So there, there, there's, if you like, modular. You can, but I love the, the hunt at the top. And you get these all over Europe. Um, I unfortunately haven't given a caption for this one, but the, the three, these three are from a, an Austrian book published in Augsburg in 1719. But this one is English, and it's from a magazine published in the 18th century with a line illustration drawn from this object, which dates from the 16th century. And that is intensely religious. Um, the left-hand one was one made for the Archbishop of Salzburg, and it's got his coat of arms on it. So they're either religious, heraldic, or they have other, other symbols. Um, and here's some I made. This is one I made. Um, it's noted in an account of the wedding feast of the first Duke of Devonshire, um, and it represents his coat of arms. They frequently use pigments which were not edible. Some of them would have poisoned you if you'd eaten it. So some of them were not meant to be um, consumed. Even um, fruit paste, marmalades, were, were printed. And even little trenches, which you ate your sweeties off, were sometimes painted and onto sugar, onto sugar plates. This is um, one I, I carved a copy of the mold. There's a mold in an English collection, which is dated 1580. And there's another motif on the other side. So I copied it and made this. But one of the things that you often get um, is this phenomenon of sticking little sugar Comforts. These are um, confetti of cloves, they're little sugar cloves. That, and they were struck, you, you get, in English, you get march pains struck with long comforts. And this is a close up of an image I'll show you later, but um, it shows you the, the, the land of marzipan and all sorts of, of, of sugar comforts. And you can see these discs here, which have, these are tiny little bits of an engraving, but they show you the comforts sticking out of the mazzapane. And this is what the comforts looked like. They're, they were made by confectioners. Um, these ones were called pearled or rough comforts. You can see like a little mottled texture or ragged comforts. And they occur a lot in paintings. If you look at Italian, German, and Netherlandish paintings from the 17th century, you'll see them sticking in marzipane, in tarts, but also in another luxury food, preserves. This is quince paste, and, or cotoniac. And sometimes these were printed with a design as well from a mold. Um, and often, they too, when they were put on the table, you can see a wonderful close-up of one here in this Franz Franken painting. Here are the long compass. And you can see that this has been printed in a, in a, in a mold. 
And here's a recreation of some of these uh, kind of things. You can see my versions of the ragged comforts and again, printed marmalades, sitting on a sugar plate, of course. You made your plates out of sugar and it saved the washing up. <laughs> and then you often get um, these things. I go back, you can see here these almond paste cookies made in the form of alphabet. But I'm showing you this because there was this, there's a human desire to embellish food. It happens in all cultures. Um, if you go to Thailand on holiday, they'll give you a little carved carrot that looks like a fantastic rose or orchid or whatever. People want to do this and want to ornament, you know. And we think it enlivens the occasion and it is decorative. But as I say, there are often meanings lurking in that uh, cookie which you may not be aware of. And here's an example of all the sorts of sweet foods that were popular at this period. And in fact, most of these were made out of that manuscript recipe book, which is in my collection. Even little fake walnuts made of sugar containing little sweeties or a message. Fortune cookies have been around a lot longer than the San Francisco uh, World Fair. Okay, so that's the kind of more intimate landscape of the table. The marzipan as the bas-relief version of the sugar sculpture, and all of the other little ornamental things, whether they're wafers or little alphabet cookies. Um, one of the big influences in France, emanating from the court of Louis XIV, and you can see this very clearly in some of the wonderful prints from these extraordinary festivals held at Versailles in the middle of the century, um, was the use of this extraordinary pyramid as a, a focal point of many of the tables. And this is not a French table, it's an English table. Um, Marcia in her book illustrates not this, but the actual source of this table. Did this table a few years ago. But can you see the pyramids in the middle? These are the sweet dishes of the dessert and they stay in the middle of the table there's the source of it, this book by Patrick Lamb, who was the cook to Charles II, James II, William and Mary, and Queen Anne. And his, his book was published posthumously. And this is um, a plate that Marcia illustrates. And I hope that image I've shown you illustrates what that table looked like. It shows all of the courses of the meal, but they've been sort of contracted down into these little circles. And there are four different soups. But what you must understand is that only one person sat at this table. It's the king's table. This is very common. If you go up to the gallery, you'll see a coronation feast from England of James II. And there's only two people sitting at the table, James and his Italian anorexic wife. And <laughs> they're sitting in front of 145 hot dishes and another 30 cold dishes come in a bit later on. And one of the cold dishes is, I think it's 25 puffins cold. These are birds. And there's one plate which has got two roast fawns on it. That's two bambies on one plate. You know, and that's one of 145 other dishes. They couldn't possibly eat all of this. So it percolated down through other guests and eventually a lot of it ended up being out on the street. And it's politically a very clever thing to do because the pauper who's wandering around Whitehall chewing on a cold puffin is sharing food from the sovereign's table, you see. So it puts... It, Charles I, James's father, didn't have a coronation feast. He, he was a very private man and didn't want to sit down and eat in public. And look what happened to him. The minute after his feast, there were broadsides attacking him for not having a coronation feast. He gets tried in Westminster Hall, where he would have had his coronation feast, and he gets beheaded outside the banqueting house at Whitehall. Karma, I think. And there's a close-up of the pyramid. So this Service à la Pyramid is very much a French fashion, and it lasts for about a century, right into the middle of the 18th century. And it, it tends to overshadow 
some of the more sculptural um, centerpieces. You get it also on the buffet. This is a buffet I constructed at Chatsworth in England using the first Duke of Devonshire's wonderful silver from the 1690s. Um, in a room which was made for a visit of William and Mary. William was the king who sat down alone at the big table I showed you. Um, so he spent a fortune. He got an architect called William Talman, a great court architect, and the artist Antonio Verrio to decorate these new state rooms, which were for the visiting king and queen, and was often the case they decided not to come and nearly bankrupted him. Um, but we've set that, this up in the room, and you can see... Um, the grandeur of just the drinks bar, basically, you know. This is where they go and prepare their margaritas and take them. Well, they didn't have margaritas, but you can see the great cistern underneath, which would have had ice in it to put the bottles of wine. And the family actually baptized their children in that still, not in champagne. That would be just a little bit too ostentatious. Whoops. Okay. So let's come to sugar itself, and um, I've called this little section the metamorphosis of, of sugar, and um, I'm going to deal with these figures, which you can see the wonderful examples in the, um, the gallery um, in more detail a little bit later on, but they're going to kick me off, because sugar itself can be metamorphosized into other objects. For instance, a very popular Renaissance party trick was to make playing cards out of sugar, and then when you, or a chess set, so when you took a, your um, opponent's piece, you could eat it. <laughs> and this continued, believe it or not, right through into the 19th century. Um, a New York-based ice cream mold manufacturer called Eppelsheimer and Company in the 19th century actually made a complete chess set in, for make, in ice cream. They also made a complete set of molds to make the full set of cards. Can you imagine playing with ice cream cards? More of a party joke. And the, the, the other thing, of course, is that with this extraordinary material, if you use the, this gum called gum tragacanth from the Middle East and mix it with another Middle Eastern sourced um, material, at least in the medieval and Renaissance period, suka or sugar, to use its Arab name, um, you can make the most delicate objects. You can make sugar flowers. You can make a basket to put them in. This is actually a Sevres biscuit ceramic or porcelain basket from, from Paris, from the Louvre. Um, but these are flowers that were made using pigments and tools from the 18th century and shows how they were used on a table, probably at Versailles. The um, they didn't want real flowers on the table like we do now. They thought that the smell interfered with the sense of taste. And figures could be made in many ways. You could free model them, which is quite difficult. You need a great deal of skill because it's much more difficult to freely model this material with this because it dries out very. You can do it and you'd have to make it on an armature. It was much more common to put together this seahorse, which is from an early 18th century mold, beautifully carved. It's actually in relief. It, for some reason, the light of the photograph makes it look as though it's actually coming out. But this is an intaglio mold, which you push things into. But note how, sorry, wrong button. Note how the wings, the legs, and other components are all made separately, and then you put them together. And it means you can make lots of them. And this is the technique with which a lot of these were made. I've done a workshop this morning, um, you know, showing how some of these things could be made. That's, that's my own little workspace a few years ago. Um, and this extraordinary um, sort of panoply of arms has been created using um, moulds from the 18th century. This is rather late. This is a, um, from a 19th century, very early 19th century English confectionery book, which was written by a man who'd been the confectioner for a short while to um, the Prince Regent. And this is a sugar basket, which he illustrates. He gives you very brief instructions to do it, but he tells you enough. But the problem is 
You can't do this without the right equipment. So, for instance, you need these. These are called mosaic molds. And you press the sugar in, and then you scrape it off. You get it out. And you can then put it into um, a, a, a mold. You can line it and then make this extraordinary Regency basket. And again, with all of these things, and assemble it together. So this technique was often used to make these earlier ones too. I like 19th century books because they give you more detail. And this is, you know, a time when you think everything's becoming industrialized. But no, people are still doing this. And they give it more information than the earlier, more beautiful books. So you can work backwards. So for instance, this technique was probably quite similar to the technique used by the people who made these wonderful sugar sculptures for this papal feast. On the right, or your right, is Queen Christina of Sweden. Um, and on the left is one of the popes, I forget which one, quite a few at this time. And um, you notice how his table is much higher than hers, even though she's a queen. And she's sitting on the left-hand side, which um, denotes her inferiority to him. And he's got a lot more sugar sculptures on his table than she has, of course, you know. Um, so the, the Italians, during the course of the 16th and 17th century, but as I've shown you from the Sforza wedding in Pesaro in 1475, this had been around. But you've got to remember that Venice was the trading post through which sugar came into Europe. And uh, Venetian artists, um, sometimes, you know, Sansovino, for instance, did some designs um, which were actually turned into sugar sculptures after his death. Um, Venice was the place which was so important because that's where the sugar came from, the Arab world. And it wasn't really until we turned it around and started growing it in the Caribbean and South America that the real problem of the politics of sugar really starts. Although I don't suppose the Asiatic growers of it were treated any better than the poor black slaves who were growing it in the Caribbean islands. But it's a different sort of type of history. Um, I'm going to give you a case study of some sugar sculpture that you can see some wonderful books in the exhibition that were published in. One version was published in Rome and the other a year later in London in, after the coronation um, of James II of England, who was a Catholic. And he sent an embassy to, um, to the Pope, Innocent XI, just after his coronation. And um, this was the palace in which his ambassador, a man called Roger Palmer, um, lived, and they planned a great banquet. And if you look very carefully at this, you can see these marvellous frescoes on the ceiling by Pietro Cortona. This is called the Palazzo Pamphili and is in the Piazza Navona. It's now the Brazilian embassy, and I had to really fight them to get in there to see this. It's not open to the public. But if you look at the engraving of the table, which is only a detail of it, you can see the Cortona um, frescoes and the door, the wonderful Baroque doorways, you know, in, well, the Mannerist, really, which sort of Borromini had designed. And they're still there. Because the room hasn't changed. I would love to do this in that room. Um, we're just showing you part of the, the table. You can see the full version upstairs in the exhibition. Um, but let me try and point out, this enormous six-foot-high sugar triumpho shows the triumph of Catholicism. Um, I don't want to go into it in detail. There's a much sharper image of it in the book. These other sculptures are all, again, iconographic of the occasion. For instance, oh, I'll just go back, point out one thing to you. King James II didn't attend this um, event. He sent a painting, <laughs> which is put under a canopy. The painting was painted by the, the person who organized it, John Michael Wright, who wrote the book. He was the only member of the Guild of St. Luke, the Artist Guild in Rome. And he probably knew people who could do this sort of work and commissioned these artists to do it. And so we have, for instance, um, these eagles and lions and unicorns. You'll see them. These were the supporters of the, of the 
royal Stuart coat of arms. On one side, you've got a unicorn. On the other side, you've got a lion. Whereas the eagle, if we go back to them, you can see the eagles with their wings like this. They are the symbol of Maria d'Este, who, or Maria, sorry, Maria di Modena, who was the, um, the, the queen consort of James. And this was a very important occasion in terms of her as well. And then four of the sculptures represent the four elements. So we have Volcano, Vulcan on the left, and Nettuno on your right. And you think, my God, this is a bit of a challenge. You know, this is sugar sculpture in the style of Gian Lorenzo Bernini, but it is possible you can do it. But the thing is, this may not be exactly true to what happened because it's likely that these were gilded or painted. And there is some very nice evidence for that in the exhibition. Go up there and hunt for it. And I'll give a $2 prize to anyone who can find it. <laughs> OK, let's go back a bit to... Um, this is a very early um, March pane mould. The thing about these moulds is they were probably multi-purpose. Um, in different parts of Europe, you had different things. You had lebkuk and gingerbread. There was springlay, which was a type of biscuit. There were speculas, and they were all molded using things like this. But these were big. They were usually about 18 inches in diameter. This is a 15th century one, um, sadly destroyed, but fortunately someone produced a catalogue of these at the museum in the early 20th century with photographs. And it shows Mary in the garden. And I'm showing this, really, because... During the course of the late 17th and throughout the 18th century, creating a garden on your table, whether it's made out of almond paste or sugar, becomes a very important element in the whole way of displaying. It's like your estate in miniature in front of your guests, um, showing off your wealth. Um, here's a marvelous illustration from a, a German carving book. And the sculpture here, the triumphal arch and the pyramids are actually made from folded napkins, not from sugar. But this probably just sat over by the buffet in the room just as a wonderful little caprice for the, the guests to enjoy. Um, the, the piece that um, I was commissioned to do for the Edible Monument exhibition um, was derived from this um, engraving in a little book published in the middle of the 18th century by a French cook, confectioner, food writer. We know very little about him, Menon. And um, so the parterre that you see here have been scaled down. This is an earlier version of it that actually came to the Getty 16 years ago. Um, this is a temple of Circe, um, where Ulysses men are turned into swine. Um, it's an allegory of greed, if you like. So when all of the wealthy French diners are sitting around the table and they've got, all got classical educations and they recognise what's going on and they've been stuffing themselves with the ragouts and fricassees um, and, and they are now devouring all the sweeties of the dessert course, they can ponder upon the sin of gluttony. Um, they might be educated in the humanist tradition, but they're all devout Christians. And this tradition of the garden with its parterres is pan-European. This is one um, which um, is a Dutch one to celebrate a big event in Amsterdam in the 1750s. Um, and some of you will be familiar with this. This book is in the um, exhibition. And the parterres on this glass plateau are made of chenille, a covered little cardboard boxes, and then filled with colored sugars. These sugars were called sable d'office, sugar sands, and they were colored, and they were put through a sieve so they were all the same, and you could fill them with these colors, or you could fill them with little dragé. So you can see this is inspired by that. You can see the parterres are woolly, so it looks like the bushes. And these are the little flower beds. And then there's a mixture of sugar sculpture and porcelain. In, and this wonderful uh, Cardinal de Rohan celestial blue dessert service. And sometimes sugars were sprinkled onto the glass mirror. 
as here, can you see you've got like a basket with fruit in it? And that's, I've done that. It's very difficult. They use stencils. But it was sometimes done free-handed. This is a little confectioner's trade card that is in my collection. And it shows a little putto. He's got a folded piece of paper, and it's filled with sugar sands of different colors. And he's creating a landscape. Can you see that? On a section of the mirror plateau that these arrangements were usually put onto. Now, obviously, it's an ephemeral art form, and nothing like that has survived. It would have just been brushed away at the end of the dinner. But one of the practitioners of this art who worked for um, George III of England in London, he was a Bavarian confectioner called Joseph Zobel, and there were many others at, at this period. They're mainly Germans working in England. They... One or two of them started, instead of using sugar, they started using colored marble dusts and colored sands. And Zobel actually was talking to George III, who said, this is a terrible waste. Why don't you stick it down and make it permanent? And he worked out a way of doing that. And he, he started making sand paintings, but he also made at least one plateau, and one of them has survived. And to give you an idea of how good this sugar sand work was, this is a piece of one of the plateau. Um, so this is all sprinkled colored sands, but the sugars were probably just as good. There were accounts of Claude Lorraine landscapes being done on the glass using this material. This setting too, you can see this is an Italian setting from Naples, and if you look carefully, you can see these parterre again. These are sprinkled ones. This book is remarkable, written by a monk, actually, Vincenzo Corrado, and he gives you um, directions for 12 months of the year to make a dessert that's correct for that month. This one shows Primavera under a baldacchino, the, the goddess associated with um, the dawning um, spring. But if you look carefully at that, you can see that one device that was quite common was a border of sugar uh, pyramids and swags of flowers and little vases of flowers. I recently used this um, idea um, in Toronto at the Gardner Museum. Um, and you can see here um, these um, pyramids sitting on bases with um, these 2,000 sugar flowers there. And the other, the other flowers are made from paper and wax. You can see some upstairs in the gallery. The they made them from um, newspaper sometimes and even from rice paper. Um, again, they didn't want fresh flowers on the table. And the great thing was you could reuse them. You could keep them in the cold kitchen and put them out. It's a mixture here of porcelain and, and, and sugar. Um, the Gardner Museum was founded by a man called George Gardner, who was very friendly with Colonel Sanders. And once Colonel Sanders was invited to cook some, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken for, for Mr. Gardner, and because he had this fantastic collection of ceramics, he served it to uh, Colonel Sanders on a Meissen service, you know, a really important one. And I, when I was there, I said to the curator, I don't remember that Meissen ever produced a porcelain family bucket, but I might, I might be wrong. Um, this relates to, you can see the original image of this upstairs. Um, this is an image of a, 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 a banquet given to Maria Theresia. She's just about to be not the Archduchess, but the Empress of Austria, and she's sitting with her husband. Notice he's on her left-hand side, Franz Anthony of Lorraine. She's going to be the Empress, so she's much more important than him. So she's the one on the right. And um, you can see they're sitting down um, at the course of their meal, just the two of them, with all these servants around them, all probably high-ranking dignitaries. And in the middle of the table are these two sugar baldacchini, and um, I reconstructed these for an exhibition on Vienna du Pacquier porcelain at the Met in 2009. This is one of the installation shots, and we're using porcelain from that period. Um, 
some wonderful things. That's not quite complete, that table. It, was more, it had a big vitrine put over it. There's a close-up. Okay, so that's the court. That's the high-status table connected with these important aristocratic events. Well, what about those people out on the street? Well, one of the aspects of the exhibition, which is probably the most exciting, is this idea of the Cocania feast, where um, for one day in the year, there's a great big festival where the poor actually get to share the food. In fact, they can steal it and run away with it. And um, you'll see these remarkable images of um, food landscapes um, upstairs. The world is turned upside down. The natural order is reversed. So, um, and it's based on this kind of peasant tradition which goes way back into the medieval period. Or oh, there's this never never land called the land of cocaine where your dinner just drops out of the sky ready roasted onto your plate. And if you work, you'll be sent to prison. And the rivers flow with wine and honey and milk. And there is, look, there's the land, sorry, there's the land of the, the, of the Campania, of the um, Marzipani and all sorts of comforts. And all sorts of other fr food is just there for the taking. A lot of the peasants of Europe were actually half starved most of the time. So this is a predominant dream. I don't know if you've ever been hungry. I was once on an exhibition in China and we lost most of our food and we spent three weeks eating about 200 calories each a day. And about six days into this, I was fast asleep having a very, very intense dream. And I, I was floating in the void like this, you know. And I could see this little light coming towards me at great speed, like a meteor, right? And it suddenly came very close, and I could see it was actually a fried egg. <laughs> and it went whoosh, like that. And I, I missed it. And then I suddenly saw another one, and I missed that too. You know, obviously my hungry state had induced this absolutely crazy dream. So this fantasy was very much to do with the fact a lot of the time there wasn't enough food on the, the table for the poor. You can see the original on this upstairs. It's one of my favorite, favorite thing in the whole show. It's this beautiful drawing. It's not a print. It's an original drawing. And it shows this extraordinary pyramid obelisk in the middle of this great square in Livorno. It was financed by the Jewish community in the city. But all over that... Um, there's food, there's roast birds, there's birds in the feather, and everything is up for grabs at the end of the festival. But again, there's probably a fireworks display, there's probably um, a wonderful musical or theatrical or choreographed performance. So this is just one aspect of it, and the, the poor can try and climb up the poles to get the food at the top of the poles, very common motif. And, of course, all of the aristocratic onlookers can have a really good laugh at them when they fall down. It's a strange kind of, of charity. It's the world, if you like, inverted. And there is another tradition that um, you get where the natural order of things is inverted. These are popular prints. And, and this one, for instance, shows, shows the rabbit roasting the man in front of the fire. But what's extraordinary is that there are little moulds in the marzipane tradition. Um, look at the, the motif of the little um, laurel leaves around. And here, for this is early 19th century. It's either Italian or French. This is in my collection. And you can see the dog has made the man run for the stick. And the performing man is entertaining his master, the bear, and this is a very common one where the butcher is just about to be slaughtered by the animal. Um, and again, it, the whole thing is expressed not just in the, the prints and the artwork, but also in food. So you can see these are the dreams of the poor in many ways. And another type of food which relates very closely to sugar is when this happens for one day of the year, in Europe, all over Europe, on the 6th of January, the Feast of the Epiphany, um, this was the time when the, 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 the wealthy three kings bring presents to the poor child in the, the manger. And it was a day, for instance, when eventually during the medieval period, um, anybody 
at the royal courts could become the king for the day, or the queen for the day too. Um, and I'm showing you an English tradition. We've just made, well, decorated one of these this morning in, in a workshop, um, rather similar to this. Um, the two crowns represent the king and queen for the day. And the way they're chosen is sometimes they hid some objects inside the cake, which was symbolic of being the king or the queen. Sometimes it was a bean, a pea, but there were also all sorts of other things too. And these are called twelfth cakes. And they're the sort of last vestige, if you like, in the 18th and into the 19th century um, of the earlier sort of court tradition of sugar sculpture. Um, here's one in a setting with some food. We did this for a, a documentary about these things. And then during the 19th century, what had started out as a court thing becomes a bit more democratized because sugar's cheaper and we've got a lot more wealth around in the industrialized nations like England particularly and in France too. And um, you can go to a confectioner and buy quite simple sugar sculpture and it's not that expensive. Um, but one of the big watersheds was the um, Napoleonic Wars because the iconography there is very masculine and it's to do with victory. This is a, a victory banquet made using a set of molds and some drawings that I managed to find purchased and it's now in an English museum. And from them we created this victory banquet from the time of Napoleon. Close up of the triumphal arch. And here's one of the drawings that was put together later on, probably in the, about 1818, um, by this man called Prati. This is one of his drawings, and you can see his obelisk. The, the molds to make that have survived in the collection. On the left is a sugar mobile, a tremblant. So when you sit down at the table, all the little um, lanterns and the parrots, and they move around. Um, and there are molds to make some of the things in that. Um, I've made the sugar basket there. In fact, that's the mold to make that basket there from his work. For, he worked for the um, Savoy family, who became the kings of Italy. And those of you who've been to my workshop earlier on might recognize that. But from this period onwards, you get these little sugar things you can buy at confectioner's shops, which are called sugar toys. And it starts to become a bit sentimental and purely decorative, and it descends into to kitsch. That basket on the right, actually, if you look at it, you can see, I hadn't put the, um, the handle on, but that's it made there. And then, you know, when we get into the later 19th century, you get the last vestige is the wedding cake, which still survives. The techniques have changed. Piping is being used. It was introduced by German confectioners in the middle of the 19th century. And you get little curious things like this little automobile and the bus above. So that takes us up to the end of the 19th century. Now, I don't know. I'm probably overrunning, am I? Have I got... Yeah, so I'll finish there. Um, there's so much to say, um, and I've only got an hour to say it. So anyway, I hope that you can revisit the galleries and look around, and you might just get another little dimension in there, and it will help you understand this. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir, yeah. You want to chair it then? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So we do have time for questions. I bet you have lots of them. And we have people with microphones. It's very important for other people to hear the question. So please wait for the microphone. I have one here. Uh, the four-sided mold, the wooden mold, it looked like a post uh, early on. What was the scale of that? How, how wide? Could you, uh, sorry, could you say that again? Because uh, the four-sided mold uh, that looked like a post early on that had the royal crest at one end. What was the scale of that? How wide? It's about that long. 
and about that wide. Okay. It's, it, sorry, it's about that long and about that wide, and it's made from boxwood. And you don't get big bits of boxwood. Thank you. Yeah. Any others? Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, could you say a little, a few words about the um, preservation or lack of preservation of these sugar sculptures, and how they would have been destroyed or consumed or not sure. consumed? Yeah. Um, this sort of thing starts off as a joke. You remember the, the plates I mentioned that you could eat after you'd eaten the food off them? That's where it really starts with that, the playing cards. They're the sort of precursor of this thing, making something out of sugar. But they then realize that the material is so fine and so malleable that you can create works of sculpture that were as good as anything that you might be able to carve out of marble or out of wood or, or cast in bronze. But the material's ephemeral, and it will deteriorate. The, the um, centerpiece I've made here will eventually deteriorate, but it might be okay for the next 20 years. But bits will start flaking off, and it might change color a bit. And with that in mind, some of the confectioners who made these things, certainly in the 18th century, they might be commissioned to make them for one occasion, but written into their contract was that they would be able to keep it sometimes, and they would rent it out. Earlier on, they tended to be given to gifts, especially to the ladies who would take them home in their carriages. There, there are one or two accounts of that. Um, but it is an ephemeral material, and it will eventually um, give up its ghost, especially if you live in Florida. You know, you'll, you'll end up with a a kind of amorphous, kind of, you know, abstract expressionist sugar <laughs> pond, you know, when, it's, when you finish with it. Is that, does that answer your question? Yes, are there any others? There was a gentleman here in the front who... Um, hello. Thank you for that lecture, it was very interesting. My question is maybe related to the one uh, before this. So the, the fact that these um, materials were so ephemeral and you mentioned how they often had a political dimension, would you say that the fact that they were ephemeral maybe lent for a more, um, how would you say, maybe a more subversive content or something that was maybe more politically daring that, and then something that maybe would have been created in, say, painting or sculpture or more uh, permanent commissions? Yeah. Can I just turn that on its head a little bit? Because the art that we've inherited from the past um, was a lot of the stuff that was intended to be permanent because it was durable. But particularly during the 17th century, um, there was a tremendous amount of ephemeral art produced for the theater, for festivals on the streets. And often once the festival was over, the artworks would be destroyed, like the Cocania pyramids and the triumphal arches that were often made for these occasions. And, and, and sugar and other food materials were just part of the landscape of ephemeral art. And of course, ephemeral art through its very nature doesn't survive. And we only know about a lot of it through the kind of engravings that have survived because these festivals were important enough for them to be documented at the time. And often the festival books are almost like souvenirs of the occasion. Um, so I'm not so sure about the subversive nature of it, but um, I think a lot of it was pure fun. Um, you know, eating, I mean, eating this stuff, they, I mean, surely some drunk would bite the head off Apollo at a dinner party, you know. Um, someone else might, you know, bite, put it in his tea or coffee, you know, or chocolate or whatever, you know, one head or two. Um, but um, um, obviously there are some very powerful political messages in a lot of this stuff. But we're talking about a period when the, the, the hierarchy of society is very top-down and very, you know, hierarchical in the sense that um, most people would never experience these dinner parties. They were totally elitist. But I turn that on its head in a way too because um, food, all food, even this stuff, is working-class culture completely because it's the working-class people who make it and innovate it. They're working in the kitchens of the wealthy, 
Louis XIV didn't know how to boil an egg, let alone make a sugar sculpture. He employed people that did, and they were the innovators and they were the artists. Um, and they're no different to the furniture makers or the artisans or the nameless stonemasons who have produced our kind of heritage in our great cities. Um, these sugar sculptors were the same. They were lowly servants, but they were the innovators. And although the patron sort of sets the kind of culture in a way, these guys created it. So for me, I don't like the socialist argument at all about this. I turn it back to front. You know, the Pyramid of Cheops um, is not a monument to the pharaoh. It's a monument to the poor slaves who built it. Um, and I think you've got to look at it like that. That's my stance, anyway. Any other questions? Yes? I actually had uh, two questions. The first one was about the ice cream versus sugar. Sorry, I can't hear you. Could you speak up a little bit? I have two questions. The first one is on preserving the ice cream. Uh, in relation to the question up front. Yeah. And the second one is, uh, in relation to her question, what is the most controversial piece that, that you've come across where perhaps those in the kitchen have created something that has a meaning for them, uh, but, but the folks eating it are completely ignorant of, of the message or the symbol uh, okay. in a particular piece? Two questions. The first one was about ice cream. and. Um, you're referring to that very first image, I guess, where you've got this extraordinary, you know... Well, the thing is, this was August the 14th, August in Rome. The Ferragosto is the hottest month of the year. Um, and to get this made, 150 makers were under an awning. And they, they didn't have freezers. They did it using these pewter pots called sorbettiere. And... It makes very good ice cream, just as good as ours, if you know how to do it. And they had ice, which was stored in ice caves, which was brought down in the winter from the mountains. And they would make some of them in molds. And then the molds would be put back into ice and salt. And they could keep them cold for a couple of days by changing the ice. They kept them in little boxes called ice caves. And they, they knew how to do it. They were very clever. You've got to remember, we've inherited things like ice cream. We think it's a modern phenomenon. It's not. It's been around for 300 years or more. And they did it without the benefit of electricity. And they were much cleverer than us because they invented a lot of recipes which are absolutely superb. And they knew how to do it. And they did. You know, they, they were, and they knew how to make it last. So the, the moulds would have been made the day before for the little fruits. A lot of the others were made in the morning and allowed to just freeze. And it was a choreo choreographed occasion where um, the, all these dishes were put on the table as a performance by men dressed as Hungarian warriors, you know, who came into the hall. So it was a performance. Um, the second question... Um, what's the most controversial example of one of these? Well, um, I think there's no one under 18 in the room. Um, um, I showed you some of those Nuremberg um, arm and paste molds. Um, a very large number of the very early ones, and we're talking about late 14th and 15th century, and they're all photographed are not really well known because they're completely pornographic, you know. They show bathhouse scenes with men and women doing all sorts of strange things in full Gothic style. Well, you know those wonderful ribbons of text in Gothic script coming out of their mouths while they're performing these, you know, unspeakable acts that I'm not going to go into detail about. Um, and there are other accounts of... Um, they're written in Latin, like, you know, a pudendum virile on the middle of the table made out of sugar. Um, the Latin scholars amongst you should be able to figure that one out. That was very popular, um, mainly at men-only parties, you know. Um, but the, there's that content of it, which is a subject in its own. And I'd love to give a talk about that, because I've... <laughs> I could really get the audience going. <laughs> Are there any more? Have we got time for? Maybe two more questions. Where do you 
uh, get your molds from? Um, with a, I've been doing this for 40 years, and it's taken me a very long time to find many of them. I've got a lot. I've got hundreds. Um, uh, it's usually, if, if, then, if, if I can do it in a way that's not going to damage them in any way. They're very robust, and they were designed as tools, and they can still be used if you look after them. Um, th they, um, there are many different forms. Most of them, the ones that make this kind of sugar work, were made of wood, but some were made out of pewter, um, especially for making ice, ice sculptures. Um, you can buy stuff nowadays on the internet, actually, you know, Google, um, eBay. But uh, you'll rarely find anything really, really important because some of them are immensely valuable. And you don't like the competition? No, I keep very quiet about it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last one, yes? Um, so why do you recreate these scenes? You cited a couple of examples of um, engravings and said, I would love to recreate this. Um, well, okay, if you're a, a musicologist or a musician and you find a new Mozart you know, piece of music that isn't no, never been performed before, you want to perform it, you want to play it. And my interest is very much like that. And music is a good analogy because, you know, in music you have the notation. In food we have the recipe. In music you have the instruments. And in the kitchen you've got the implements. And I've shown you a few photographs of molds. Now, you can't make this stuff without equi that equipment. So um, it's not just playing the tune. It's playing it on the correct instruments, which is very important. Um, and for me, the word ephemeral is interesting because this stuff was just designed basically for um, an event. The ice cream landscape at the very beginning uh, was part of this opera. Last year, um, two friends of mine in Prague who run an opera company called Opera Barocca actually did a performance of that in Prague. The original was in Rome. But in two years' time, we're going to do the music the fireworks, and this. And I'm actually going to do it not using modern um, equipment at all. We're going to do it using the original method. We've got some of the budget. We're nearly there. The city of Prague is putting some money into the kitty, and I've found some. Um, so it's going to be like an amazing event with the full opera, three hours long, and then the ice is gets... As you arrive in your carriage, if you can afford one, you'll get... <laughs> you'll get a little, um, little cup of um, sorbete. Okay then, somebody's phone's going on. Okay, that was a good ending. Okay.